this is Halisa Ewan. Welcome back to the Creation Gospel series, The Scarlet Harlot and the Crimson Thread. The Scarlet Harlot is workbook four in the series. And so if you're following along in the last program, we were finishing up a section called Authority, the Shemesh and the Shemash. And we were comparing that role of the middle branch of the menorah, which represents the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh. And we looked at the two aspects of that middle branch, because we know from, especially in the study in workbook one, that the main theme that we can draw from the fourth day of creation is principles of authority and governing, leadership. And that was the day that the sun and the moon were put into place, it says, to govern the day and the night, to govern the Moedim. But there's something interesting about that middle branch of the menorah. It's referred to as the Shamash, which means the servant. So the sun, which was put into place on that day, is the Shemesh, but it is the Shamash. It is the servant, and we see that pattern in the life of Yeshua, that he came as Messiah first as a suffering servant. But when he returns, he's going to come as that ruler, as that governor. It says the government will be upon his shoulders. And so the, the pattern of leadership is marked by service first, and then the ability to govern, and then as, as Yeshua says to the church at Thyatira, with a, even a rod of iron. Because if you put a rod of iron into the hands of an angry person or an imbalanced person or someone who is misusing or abusing the word of Adonai, they can be a, a, a huge problem within the body of Messiah. They can make a lot of mistakes and beat up a lot of people who are actually brothers and sisters in Messiah. And so we know that Yeshua doesn't think it's okay for us to go around beating up our fellow servants while we wait for his return. So preparing for that authority and that leadership in Yeshua's kingdom, the, the way that we prepare is by learning to serve one another. That's the pattern. And at the conclusion of the last program, we also talked about what happens when you need to separate from a brother because we don't want to be part of that seventh abomination of the wicked lamp, which is one who separates brothers. Sometimes, though, there is a separation. We can even see that in the example of the scriptures. There were people that really Paul just could not minister with. There were people that were easier and their gifts complemented his, and sometimes they would have disputes and they would have to part ways. But that didn't change the fact that they remained brothers and sisters in the, the ministering of the gospel. They still had the same purpose. They simply had different visions and different ways of delivering on that vision. And there's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes people are in your life and you walk with them for a season, but when you've reached the termination of that season, it's foolish to try to hang on when even the human cell itself teaches you that if there is not mitosis, if that cell does not divide, then there cannot be new growth within the body. So sometimes separation can be a good thing. What mitosis does not do is separate a cell entirely from the body. It merely divides out in order to build. And sometimes within the body of Messiah, Instead of discerning that this is a time of mitosis where, you know, this person that I've been walking with might have a different vision, a different gift. The Ruach is leading him or her in a different direction. And this division is actually not a complete separation. It's actually a healthy thing. It's a building up of the body because this person cannot accomplish his or her task if we stay joined together. Or on the other hand, maybe I can't complete my, hat, my task. Maybe this person would actually be a hindrance to me. Maybe I have a fresh vision. Or maybe I have an older vision that's not yet complete, but now this person has a new calling. 
the way that we reconcile these things, and we say, well, separation is bad, separation is good. Yes, if it's complete separation, if we're separating from one another in anger, if there are unresolved issues, if there are sins that have not been repented of, then yes, that can be a deathly separation and the seventh abomination of the wicked lamb. But on the other hand, if it's a separation and we can part ways on good terms, and just like when you send the, the Hebrew servant back out into the world after his term of service, you give him everything he needs to start over. And if someone has a new vision, talk it through. Are there any things in this new direction that would cause conflicts with you in the future? Go ahead and anticipate those things. Talk them through. Is he trying to duplicate work that's already been done? Then it, it may need, mean he needs to change his direction a little bit. You don't want to run into each other while you're trying to be faithful to your calling. And so if you have these dialogues ahead of time, if you agree to maintain not just your relationship as brothers and sisters in Messiah, but your friendship, if you have a friendship there, if you can agree to these things in the beginning and say, hey, if I can ever help you, if I ever have a resource, you know, let me be that resource for you. Call me if you need help. That is a pattern of good separation. And it may be that this separation itself is just for a season. And eventually you will circle back and you will find that you can do some things together that maybe you wouldn't have been able to do before had there not been that temporary separation. Sometimes we need room to grow and sometimes to learn to stand on our own two feet, uh, to learn how to be a leader. And if we tend to lean on other people and rely on other people, sometimes without that crutch being taken away, we never learn to step up and take that responsibility. So there can be good separations. And in the last program, we were looking at Joseph as a pattern of how to use a position of authority to reconcile brothers who had been separated. And this is what we're talking about. Joseph had all authority in his hand to punish his brothers, to take revenge on his brothers, to make their lives miserable, to end their lives. And instead, he used that position and that authority to reconcile them, not just to himself, but to one another. Because he even gives them a, a funny little uh, instruction as he sends them back home. He says, don't fight among yourselves on the way home. Don't just be reconciled to me, be reconciled to one another. Because I'm sure there had been many years of blaming and finger pointing among the brothers in their regrets over what they had done to Joseph. And so that's our position too. If we have some sort of position of leadership within our home, you know, sometimes that leadership position is within your family, over your children. It might be that you have a, a position of leadership within a fellowship or a congregation or at work. If you have that position, then use it to serve others and use it to reconcile others. We can use Joseph as that pattern so that we can say, yes, there may have been a separation of these brothers and it was for good. And that's what Joseph tells his brothers. You might have meant it for bad, but Adonai, he took it and he used it for good. If we will be faithful and we will repent, if Joseph repented of gossiping and telling tales on his brothers, and if they would repent of murderous thoughts and kidnapping and a host of other things, then there could be, you know, looking back on this period, yes, it was a bad period in their lives, but yes, it did set up future good, not just for the brothers themselves, but for their family so that they could be protected through the, the, the famine that was uh, in progress already. So Joseph understood the principle of the fourth day, which is not just leadership, but remember, it's also another day where light is separated from darkness, that there is an evening and a morning marked now by a sun and a moon where apparently there had not been before. Even though the separation occurred on the first day, 
there was no physical object that you could point to and say, yes, the sun is up in the daytime and the moon is up at night. It's not until the fourth day of creation that you get those two physical signs. But when you have these two physical signs in the heavens, the sun and the moon, and you read carefully about the fourth day, you realize the essence of the sun and the moon is not just governing an authority, but to give light in the earth. Well, the Torah is light in the earth. And so if we are to follow that pattern, if we want to aspire to any sort of leadership within the body of Messiah, then first we start by discerning what it means to give light in the earth. We want to be these children of promise. And if we're going to be these children of promise, the seed of the woman, then we're going to be characterized by a couple of things. Yes, we keep the testimony of Yeshua. We testify that he is the Messiah. He is the son of God. He is the living word. And we do the deeds that he did, which is the commandments of the Torah. He fulfilled these commandments perfectly. Every commandment that pertained to him as a Jewish male, he executed those commandments according to the, what the father told him to do. And so from this, we have our example that if we have the Torah, then it's our responsibility to give the light with love to those who are in bondage and those who are living apart from the Torah so that they can see the light. And if they have never really discerned the light before, if their heart will turn toward it, then they know where to walk, that we're being that living example because a leader by definition knows where he or she is going. And some people have been simply looking all their lives for someone who knows where they're going. And when you're living the light of the Torah and you're extending that light of the Torah to others with love, not beating them over the head with it, then I think they're much more apt to turn and to follow that light unless they're just completely wicked and that's not what they want at all. They prefer the darkness. But some people aren't out of the light through rebellion or stubbornness. They've just never been shown a better way. So we have to sometimes give that light to others in their state of immaturity, understanding that we're not going to bring them to perfection overnight. We have to meet them where they are. And so if we get hung up over the letter of the Torah, but there is no spiritual Torah that underpins it, that impels it, people know that. You can't really fool people very long. Commandment keeping alone is probably not going to, to cause you to have a following. But if people see you keeping commandments in the power of the Holy Spirit, they see that you're giving light, not taking it for yourself, then you know what? People are going to want to attach to that because with that comes great compassion for other people a concern for their healing, a concern for their needs. Now, you may not be able to meet every need. You may not be able to help everybody who reaches out to you. You simply may not have the means. Your reach may not extend that far, but at least they know that you are a friendly person and you will pray for them and you will ask the one who can help them, who can actually reach out and heal that person can heal them inside as well as outside. So I, I think one of the, the greatest deceits that we see, not just all over the world, but we, let's take it down and let's even focus it on the Hebrew roots movement. One of the greatest deceits that's out there is that our cunning, our intellect, what we know, about the Torah is making us more pleasing to the Father. And, and think about that for just a moment. You say, well, that's not the case. But it does seem to be the case. The more you read uh, what people are writing, the more you watch what they're doing, you realize that 
there is a remnant within every movement, within every move of the spirit, there's going to be a remnant who were there for the proper reasons, who were properly motivated. It's a circumcised heart. They're reaching out to their Messiah. But some people like Simon the sorcerer, they simply see a new thing and they're attracted to it because number one, they sense a vacuum of leadership, which is going to go hand in hand with any new thing. It's not going to be organized. There's going to be a little bit of chaos. And when that wicked spirit senses some disorganization or some sort of vacuum of leadership, they will zoom in there to try to take over that authority. And the technology age has made it very easy for people to do that, to to simply come in and use media, whether it's the internet or television or radio, and you've never met this person you may have never met me. You don't know anything about my life. You don't know if I live a life of faithfulness, a life of greed, a life of being hateful to others. You don't have any way to evaluate my life if you've only ever seen me on a television or heard me on the radio or watched me on the internet or read something that I read on the internet. And so you could be misled as to my character. See, you need to walk with people and form relationships to truly evaluate their character. So on the one hand, we have a great bonus, a great benefit that we have access to information through all the, these media. But on the other hand, we know less and less about the person delivering that message. So we have to be, what does it say? Wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. And so there is a place for being cunning like a serpent. See that cunning of the serpent in the garden? It was not chokhmah or wisdom in Hebrew. It's a different Hebrew word, and it means to be clever, to be cunning. And it can be confused with chokhmah or bina, wisdom and understanding. Remember, the harlot, she runs a parallel track to the virtuous woman in order to deceive you. So there may be people, even in the Hebrew roots movement, who can be walking a parallel track to those who are truly there for the right reasons. It's circumcised hearts, turning back to the Torah, wanting to serve Yeshua, wanting to serve his people, full of humility, full of good fruit. But these on this parallel track, if you evaluate them over time, what you're going to see is that you're substituting cunning, being clever with the word of Adonai for actually giving the Torah as light. In other words, they have a great capacity to learn the information and maybe even to teach the information. But if you truly evaluate their lives like Simon the sorcerer, what you realize is where their, their energy source is. Because Simon the sorcerer, he, he recognized the power that went along with the work of the Holy Spirit. And I say definitely in this generation, the move of the Spirit is turning the hearts of the sons to the fathers and the fathers to the sons in terms of taking us back to the foundations of the Torah, to the lives of the patriarchs we find in the pages of the Torah. That love is there and it's energetic. It's the Holy Spirit moving and many people are attracted to it because there's power within it. But see, their desire for that power is not for the restoration of all things. It's simply to usurp authority and to use any power or to use any light that they might have to use the information they know about the Torah to rule over others, to take authority over it, so they can use that power to subdue others. That's what the serpent did. He used his cunning and his intellect to deceive Eve away from the authentic meaning of the text. And that can happen with us. If we are not really, really careful, we have to be at least as wise or clever as that serpent. 
but as harmless as a dove. So people may come with you with the cunning of a serpent, but what you realize, they are not as harmless as a dove. They're simply there as power players, controllers. What do they get out of it? Well, for some people, they want money. For other people, they simply want to be esteemed and have the respect of others because it, it blows up that, that ego. We all have our payoff. We all have our reason why we would want to be seen as a great scholar of the word or debater of the word, but truly evaluate the life of the person. Try to find out, are there good works? Is this person, you know, spewing hatred? What's going on in the life of this person? Is this person giving light? Or is this person just creating a stir, whipping people up with emotion, or trying to wow them with new information in order to get more donations or in order to get more respect or more esteem. That type of person will walk the parallel track. But remember, the beast, the nefesh, the nefesh is all about the emotion. The beast is all about extreme emotion. Does this person, after you listen to them for a little while, do you become very angry? Do you become critical or do you become fearful? Do you see conspiracies everywhere? Are people always out to get you? Can we find one more reason to hate the church or to hate the rabbis or the synagogues or the Pope? What are they actually teaching and why? Because, see, that feeds the beast. It feeds the nefesh. It generates those strong emotions. But the ruach produces a different fruit. And it says you'll know them by their fruits. What sort of people follow after them over time? Can you see a change in these people? Are they more compassionate? Are they more balanced in their view of Scripture? Are they maturing in Scripture? Are they more patient with others who don't understand as much? Are they more generous to others? You can evaluate that fruit, and we need to be careful to evaluate that fruit. We have to test the apostles to see if they're truly who they say they are. So just being cunning, knowing a lot of Hebrew, being a Hebrew expert or a Greek expert, knowing everything in the Talmud, or uh, basically disallowing everything in the Talmud because you have so many more correct insights and you know all about these conspiracies, having calculated your own special calendar, knowing the Hebrew name of Adonai, the sacred name, or pronouncing it a certain way, often what that is is just the speech of a beast. That's all it is. Now, are we going to have to navigate through these issues and talk about these issues? You bet. We are going to have to navigate through them. Everybody has questions. But the beast is always going to push you to make a decision too early. One thing about the beast, the nefesh, your soul, your appetites, emotions, and desires, one characteristic of your nefesh is it's very impatient and it's very noisy. It wants to drown out the voice of the Spirit, which is a very still, small voice. But the beast says, make a decision now. If you don't make this decision right now, you're going to go to hell. If you don't make this decision right now, something bad's going to happen. If you don't make this decision right now, you want the mark of the beast. Well, that is the mark of the beast, pushing people to make decisions before they have the maturity to make it or the information to make it, or the chance to pray and seek the Word and seek the Father's voice while they try to arrive at a conclusion. But so many of these questions, the place they belong is up on a shelf until later, until you're able to navigate through them with some wisdom and not just your cleverness, not just your intellect. Because see, these wolves thrive on dishing out the Torah, but they are not doing it with chokhmah or bina, 
wisdom and understanding, which are two of the seven spirits, they're doing it like a snake with cunning and cleverness. And they're endlessly trying to find errors and mistakes and so forth. Instead of studying the truth, they're always looking for the dark side of everything. Well, hey, why not look on the light side of everything? Because his word is truth, but his word is also a lamp to my feet. So we need to be even more cunning than all the beasts of the field. We need to be wise to those techniques and those methods. But the way we're going to become wise to that is not with the cunning of a serpent, but with the chokhmah, the bina, the etza, the gvura, the da'at, the yirat Adonai, the seven spirits of Adonai. That is what is going to help us to discern so that we can be clever and wise, but harmless like a dove and do no harm to the body of Messiah because there will be great accounting for those we have injured and wounded without cause, simply to feed the beast of our own desire, our own need to be respected and esteemed or thought to be the one correct one in a crowd. We need to stand upright. See, the, the problem is the snake walks in and apparently he's standing up like a man and talking like a man. So how do you think the serpent is going to come to you? Is he just going to slither up out of a rock? Or will this cunning person come to you walking like a man and talking like a man, but what's actually coming out of his mouth is the speech of a beast. And what he wants is for you to identify yourself with the beast, with that speech, with that clever twist of knowledge that he's offering you. And the bait embedded in that clever intellectual approach is there's going to be something that appeals to you. There has to be something to make you bite. And unfortunately for a lot of us, that bait is the fact that we do with all our hearts want to please the Father. They know that. So now that becomes the bait. And they say, well, if you want to please the Father, if you want to be obedient to the Father, which is exactly what we want, then you need to do this this way. Well, yeah, we probably need to do this, but it's not necessarily that way because that way is very likely their way. And they will push you to make a quick decision before you have a chance to pray about it, seek counsel, because that story sounds great till someone with some real wisdom and understanding comes along and presents to you an alternative viewpoint that says, yeah, you could come to this conclusion if you stop reading the verse here. But let's look at all these other contexts of this problem, and they will give you a balanced approach to deciphering that text that is not the speech of a snake. Shalom, guys. This is Matthew Vandrells over at Hebraic Roots Network. Guys, we continue broadcasting these teachings of Yeshua of Torah to all nations by support by viewers like you. We'd ask you, if you currently do not support HRN, prayerfully consider sending us a one-time donation or maybe even a monthly donation uh, to HRN so we can continue supporting the nations with the gospel of Yeshua. It's up to you guys. It's up to you to keep this message going, and we thank you for that. Shalom. Welcome back. So how do we identify the, the clever speech of a snake? If we knew the answer to that, we would all be you know, uh, walking a perfect walk, but we're not perfect and we don't walk a perfect walk because we can't always identify the speech of a snake. Sometimes it takes time. And that's what Eve should have done. She should have taken some time instead of being pressed to make a quick decision. Why not wait until the cool of the evening? Never make a decision in the heat of the day that will wait until the cool of the evening because the beast is characterized also by heat, the color red, heat, a quick decision. And throughout scripture, the nefesh, the beast is always being told to sit down and shut up because he needs to sit down and shut up and let the spirit 
start sentences with it is written. But we can come up with a few guidelines. If you say, well, I'm reading this clever explanation of this commandment or this passage of scripture, and it, it sounds right, but there's something in my spirit that's telling me something is off. How can I know? Well, there again, good counsel, balanced counsel, people who have walked a few miles in the Torah, who have some experience and some maturity, good counsel is always rewarded. Even if you don't take it, the fact that you're willing to hear it might change your direction just slightly so that the damage is not so bad when it's over. But we can look for a few things. We can look for people who um, are using the commandments to build relationships within the kingdom. They don't have a sense of exclusivity that if you don't do this thing just this way, you can't be in our group. Now, there's going to be some deal breakers for different groups, but typically um, they only want the people in the group who do things identically, step for step the way that they do them. They allow for no diversity whatsoever. Now, if you're so diverse that all you're doing is causing a problem, maybe you should look for a different congregation. But if there's a, some sort of fellowship or assembly where every step is basically cookie cutter and there's no room for questions, that's telling you that there's a danger sign right there. Because remember, we gather to like kind and like mind, but that does not mean identical. Because different gifts are needed within the body and there should be a place to sit down and go through the scriptures with people with, you know, it being okay to ask the questions, not being seen as being rebellious, to ask the questions at an appropriate place and at an appropriate time so that it's not perceived as being a challenged or, or a rebellion or it's disruptive. But there should be a time and place where you're free to ask those questions because what you'll learn from the answers might change your viewpoint or might help you to form your viewpoint. You don't want to look for people who are keeping commandments, like I said, but using them to separate out and basically, you know, hand pick only the people who will be exactly like them. They know how to use the commandment to govern and to set free those who are in bondage. Do they have rules? Yes. Are there boundaries within that community of faith? Yes, but within those boundaries, people feel liberty. They don't feel bound up. The same way Joseph used his authority to set his brothers free. That's the key there. Um, but very often the beast of our desire is going to be clothed in questions about commandment keeping. It's okay to be patient and to give things time. So... Uh, with that said, we want to kind of wrap up that, that chapter or that section by saying that, you know, a good testimony for other people in keeping the feasts, the Moedim, the Feast of Yeshua, he's the living word. And by engaging them with that circumcised heart, what we are doing is we're more than just acknowledging that Yeshua is the Messiah or that Adonai has the authority to set the feasts, we are actually yielding our first fruits when we do that. There's one thing to say, yes, you're in charge. I see that. But it's another thing entirely to accept that with my heart and to yield the best of what I have out of respect for that position that you have in my life. So true obedience to the commandments it demands first fruits. You can't be like Cain and withhold the first fruits. You have to bring the best, and we have to bring the best into the assembly of the righteous. Whether we are leaders, we have to bring our best. If we are brothers and sisters, if we are followers, or participants, congregants, 
We have to bring our best. We have to bring our first fruits into any uh, assembly, any discussion, any disagreement. We have to bring and give our best to our brother. That is the testimony of Yeshua, a life of self-sacrifice. It's putting the beast on the altar. That's why the, the animal goes up on the altar. That's the beast. That's the nefesh. It needs to be burned up, but it's not really burned up. Because what's left is the smoke that goes up and it says that is a pleasing aroma. Why? Because that smoke is representing the spirit, where the spirit can take control and have authority over the beast. What does that do? It just demonstrates the authority of heaven over the earth. Every act of obedience is demonstrating the authority of heaven over the earth. So Yeshua's seven eyes, his seven spirits, they're trying us at every festival, every moed. And if we are engaging it with a pure heart, maybe we've not learned to do everything perfectly yet, but we're walking, we're learning, we're giving our first fruits to one another as we go through this process of learning. And Yeshua will give us the morning star. He will validate us as a faithful and true witness because we are testifying to the calendar of Adonai. We are testifying to the creation. He may have to tweak a few things when he returns, but what he wants to know is, where's your brother? Where are you? What have you done? Where's your brother? We need to be able to answer those questions. All right, let's move on. Um, if you're in your workbook, depending on your edition, we are at about page 153. And if that doesn't look right to you, then the section title is Someone's in the Kitchen with Dinah. Someone's in the Kitchen with Dinah. And what we're going to do, we're going to examine um, a very small part of the Torah in Bereshit, Genesis. And we're going to look at what happened to Dina, the wife of the sons, or not the wife, the sister of the sons of Israel. Because the sister, if you'll remember in earlier lessons, say to my sister, the sister uh, role is very important. And so Dina, as the sister of the brothers, is going to give us some prophetic things. And we're actually going to be able to see that with Dina, there's a replay of what happens to her in the book of Acts. You say, well, there's no Dina in the book of Acts. But the situation is exactly the same. It's almost as if these events were prophetic of events that would occur later in the book of Acts. And you can almost see the minds of the elders in Jerusalem as they're contemplating this problem, turning back to the Torah and saying, wait a minute, we've seen this problem before somewhere. There's a pattern for this, so let's not make the same mistakes that were made in the issue with Dina in Genesis. And so at this point, if you have the ability to pause or to stop the program and read the background scriptures, the background scriptures for this are Genesis 31, Genesis 34, and Acts 15. And I'll repeat that in case you were looking for a pen. It's Genesis 31, Genesis 34, or Acts 15. Now, if you have your workbook in front of you, those are the scriptures that are listed at the beginning of the section. Someone's in the kitchen with Dinah, but her name is Dina. We're going to call her Dina. And those background scriptures will refresh your memory on the rape of Dina, the circumstances surrounding it, and what followed which is there again, we're going to see that pattern again in Acts 15. So I want you to be able to have those two uh, narratives in your mind as we go through the, the sections there. 
So, someone in the kitchen with Dina. There is um, a type and shadow concept, and, and we see that in some of the writings in the Brit Chadashah concerning the words of the Torah, the prophets, the, the Tanakh, and it calls them types and shadows. In other words, when you read this story in Genesis, then you're going to read something else in another part of Scripture that either is going to have identical words, an identical situation, um, maybe an identical phrase within the text. And as you read that, you're going to say, I think I've read that somewhere before. I think I've seen this pattern somewhere before. And you have seen it before because that first mention or that first presentation of the text, of the narrative, was there to give you a foundational understanding of the problem. And then as you read it in later texts, you can say, wow, this is shedding more light on what that original problem was about. But there again, the original problem is there to be my key. It's going to turn the key for me over here, maybe in the other end of the Bible. Now, Dina, she's going to be one of those types and shadows. And her destiny, if we want to call it that, ended up being a little bit different from the matriarchs, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. Her story is a little sad, just like Tamar. Um, not Tamar, the one who um, was married to Judah's sons, but the Tamar that was David's daughter. And even in those two stories, there's some, some parallel structures and some chiastic sorts of things going on. But we want to look first at Dina herself. Um, and some things I would like for you to think about that you read in those chapters 31 and 34 of Genesis and in Acts chapter 15. Um, think about maybe Dina being the only daughter of Israel. And see, when we say the daughter of Israel, it kind of opens up. It, it takes us beyond this story, and it maybe puts us into a bigger story about the daughter of Israel. And what is her relationship? Who are her full brothers? Because, you know, you have half-brothers in Scripture sometimes. Uh, if there are multiple wives or concubines, as in the case of Jacob— but the pattern typically in Scripture is that even in a case where there's a family of full and half brothers and sisters, it's typically the full brother who will take responsibility for his sister. And you saw that in the case of Tamar, that her full brother Absalom took responsibility for her well-being even ahead of her father David. And you're going to see this pattern in the life of Dina, that her full brothers, Shimon and Levi, are going to take responsibility for her well-being, or at least that's what they say. That was the pretext for what they did, even over their father Jacob acting on the situation. And you can compare, if you want to compare the other Tamar, um, David's daughter, to compare the, the outcome of the two rapes and maybe some of the events that preceded them, uh, you'll find that in 2 Samuel 13. 2 Samuel 13, you can compare the two accounts, um, especially uh, verse 11 of 2 Samuel 13. There's something significant there. You might want to look up the root of Dina's name in Scripture, and when you do, what you're going to find derivatives that basically mean judgment, judgment or justice. Um, I want you to think about, as you read through those accounts, the relationship between Shechem and Dina. What kind of relationship was that? I mean, yes, it says she was raped, 
but how did the relationship continue to progress? Did it continue to be a violent relationship or was it something else? Does that change the perspective of the brothers at all when they look at what happened? Would you think as you read how the king of Shechem, Shechem's father, as he explains the terms of the deal to the Shechemites, do you see any twists of phrase in how he explains the situation to them that makes you think this is more of an economic transaction than a Romeo and Juliet story? And think about the sincerity test that Shimon and Levy demanded. They have some demands. It's, we'll call it the sincerity test. What do you think of that test? What do you think the motivation really was? Can you tell the motivation by the outcome? And does that motivation, you think, shed any light on what you read in Acts chapter 15 and possibly what the motivation of certain people was? Think about the day that Shech, that uh, Shimon and Levi execute judgment on Shechem. What is significant about that day or that number? And if you've uh, read workbook two, which is um, the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls of Revelation and the wicked lamp, if you remember some of the information there about the black horse in Revelation, um, See if you can correlate the, the day of their judgment to the black horse in any way. Now, if you haven't read that workbook yet, I'm probably teasing you, so just, just skip over that. Um, but these are things I would like for you to kind of be mulling over as we go through the lesson here and talk about Dina as a type and a shadow and what she might have uh, in common with this pattern that we've been following, following of the matriarchs. And that pattern is no matter where they go, whether they go to Egypt, whether they go to the land of Levon, even in Beersheba, which is technically within the land itself, but it turns out to be a land of captivity for Rebekah. In each of these journeys, the pattern is that eventually, through the wife, through the matriarch, or matriarchs in the case of Jacob, that the patriarchs always end up back with the land, back in covenant, and back with the people of Israel, back with the children of promise. Think about that pattern. And as we look at Dina, we're going to see, well, are there any elements of that here? Is there any hint of prophecy? Because typically when these matriarchs or these women of Scripture are mentioned, even if it's only briefly, which the Torah is prophecy itself, but something very significant in terms of prophecy is taking place. And with Dina, we're going to see that something significant in terms of prophecy is taking place. And it's going to show us what happens when the sister is not protected. And we see this sister um, concept, it keeps popping up. And that's why we're pointing back to the patriarchs with this. Because Sarah literally was Abraham's half-sister. But later, in order to get himself out of trouble, he says, say you are my sister. And he does this twice. And Isaac comes along in the next generation, and he repeats the mistake. He says to Rebecca, say you're my sister. And then Jacob comes along in his generation, and he marries two sisters. So the, the, the sister pattern here keeps cropping up. Well, now we have a sister who is a daughter of Israel. And something is going to happen to her when she is not protected. Because remember, when you start moving in prophecy, moving according, and this happens when you begin to obey the commandments. 
when you begin to obey the commandments, when you begin to obey, obey Moses, you're beginning to move in prophecy. Remember, Moses is the prophet and the prophets are his legs. All right. What you do is you give legs to Moses when you actually do start to not just hear, but to do what the commandments are. When you start behaving in that, that way, the dragon, the harlot, is going to become very angry. That's their job. Remember, the beast is characterized by extreme emotion. And so he will become angry with you. He's, he's very malevolent. The spirit is very vicious. Uh, it's called Hamas. It manifests itself in violence, especially before the flood. And so this Hamas starts to act out. And if the beast discerns that someone who was walking in the commandments or walking in the covenant, walking in the land, according to the commandment, which we know Jacob had been, there was a command there. You are the one that's going to carry on this covenant. This promise is given to you and your children. It's, you're going to be the one who protects this covenant. Well, Dina is part of that because she is his daughter. Therefore, the predator, the beast, is going to look for any weakness to try to take a daughter of Israel and render her unfit to carry on the covenant according to the promise. So what we see is the sister has to be protected. We're looking at the sister as a parable so that we can understand the reality. Dina was not adequately protected from the beast the way that Abraham did not adequately protect Sarah from Pharaoh. He allowed Sarah to be taken into Pharaoh's harem and just said, say, you're my sister to keep me out of trouble. And so he even allowed a question mark to, to be placed next to her integrity. And even though she's vindicated by Pharaoh, he allowed the question mark to be put there. He, he created the conditions by not protecting her. Same thing with Isaac. He did not protect Rebekah. And she's taken into the harem of Avimelech. That lack of protection, even though on the other side they come out with much wealth, failing to protect her was a lesson. It was a test. Even Jacob, when he makes this oath that when Levon is looking for the household idols, he says, whoever has it is going to die. Well, what happens to Rachel? She dies. He really didn't think about his words before he spoke them. If you don't know, it's best to keep your mouth shut sometimes. So Jacob misspoke, and he did not protect his wife, and she ends up dying on the way to Bethlehem, Ephratah. So with Dina, what the brothers should have understood and what Jacob should have understood is she needs to be protected as a daughter of Israel and a sister of these brothers, these 12 brothers, the adversary, the beast, is going to see her as prey. He's going to want to take her down and destroy her ability to sow seed. And that's pretty much what happens. It's, it's not a good story from Dina's perspective or Shechem's, or I guess probably not from a Shechemite's perspective either. But they have some ownership in what happened to them. But this particular bit of the Torah you can see later becomes the guideline for some questions in Acts 15. When you have Jewish brothers um, and they're beginning to form relationships with the Gentiles. The Gentiles have heard the gospel of Yeshua and they are turning and starting to move back and to identify with the land, with a covenant, and with the people of Israel. And what these brothers 
understand from the precedent in the Torah is that the sister needs to be protected. These returning Gentiles are under suspicion because we have patterns where if, if you allow the Gentiles to come in and form relationships, all of a sudden there's assimilation, there's idolatry, there's every evil work, there's lack of respect for the commandments. In effect, they destroy the sister because the sister, we found out later in Proverbs, is a parable of the Holy Spirit. And so the last thing you want to do as these Gentiles, like the Shechemites, who wanted to come into the covenant and make a family covenant, the last thing you want them to do is to destroy the sister, to destroy the spirit of the Torah. But on the other hand, among those who are rejecting the Gentiles or creating a very harsh condition for them to join that family, what we can look and see is possibly their motivation was very much like Shimon and Levi's. And they're demanding the exact same thing. They're demanding the circumcision of the Gentiles to say, we'll see if they're serious or not. When what we know from the precedent is they really don't care if the Gentiles are serious or not. That's irrelevant. What they're seeing here is an opportunity, an excuse to get their revenge and to get stuff, which is what Shimon and Levi ended up with. They plundered the Shechemites after they killed them. So we've got Gentiles who are returning to the covenant but we have some here who are making it difficult for them. In order to discern a proper course of action, the elders at the Jerusalem Council, they're going to have to go back to the scriptures, look at them, look at it in a balanced way, and say, how was the outcome not good back here? Here's our problem. How can we ensure that our outcome is good? Of course, sometimes, no matter how hard you try, <laughs> the outcome is not going to be good. There's that risk, but we still have to apply the Torah. Hey everybody, this is Daniel McGurr with Ancient Covenant Ministries and I'd like to have you consider donating to HRN because everything that goes on here is based basically off of your donations and not only does your donations help you able to watch these programs, but it also helps the message to go forth around the world and to allow other peoples to watch. So I ask you to consider donating your money to the station if you can and if you can't, that's fine too. But please consider donating to HRN. Thank you.